Hi, my name's Bob Buckley. Um, I have a son, we'll call him K, is, is initial for the purpose of this exercise. We've recently been through, um, we're one of the first in the ACT to um, get an NDIS plan approved. And I thought I'd talk about that experience mainly because it's a very positive experience and a lot of people are very concerned about this. So I thought it would be worthwhile to uh, just talk about that and help people um, really realise that this process is probably not as fearful as some people are feeling at the moment. So I'm just going to run through a quick presentation here. Um, I'm going to talk about the specifics of our experience and the outcome that we've had. Um, then talk a bit about what I think the lessons um, about, uh, that arise from that are. Um, then I've got some suggestions and some conclusions about um, what the process is like uh, and, and how you might prepare for it and think about it as you go into it. So, he's um, a young man, he's 23 years old. He has severe autistic disorder, or ASD. Um, he also has tricuspid atresia. Um, you don't need to know what that is. Um, it's, it's a heart condition, so he had two bouts of heart, open heart surgery by the time he was three. Um, but that really has relatively little impact on his life compared to his autism. Uh, he currently lives at home with his parents and his sister. Um, we went into the uh, NDIS process, we were one of the first in, I expected to be one of the last, but it transpired that we were one of the first. Um, I've, I've spent a lot of time talking to people in other states and things, so I was relatively prepared for what to expect, I understood what the process was, I have a lot of contacts in other states, so I, I was relatively well equipped to do this and what I'd like to do is help people here in the ACT be as well prepared for the process and hopefully reduce a lot of the anxiety that's around about the NDIS. And I think that's fair to expect that there's relatively little anxiety for adults. I don't think that's true for the early intervention group, but I think for adults, the process looks pretty good to me. I'm pretty happy with how it goes. Um, so clearly quite severely autistic. Many people would regard him as non-verbal, although he's hyperlexic as well, if you know what that means. Um, that means he knows just about every word in the dictionary. Um, but he hardly ever uses functional language. Um, so he wasn't actually able to contribute much himself and he wasn't really involved in the planning. The, where possible, I think the NDIS is really keen that, that people whose plan is being prepared are very involved in the planning and I, I think that's the way it should be. Unfortunately in our case that doesn't turn out to be the way that it works. Um, so he came to the first meeting, um, the plan has fairly quickly decided that they were going to talk mostly to his parents. Um, he came again at the end of the third meeting for a while. So the, the NDIS people knew who he was, so I'd say to people make sure that happens. Uh, for most of this group, I think that's almost certainly going to be the case. Um, the NDIS wanted to know lots about all our existing services. Um, basically, I think they wanted to know what they were replacing because they have a sort of expectation that they're going to do as well as be or better than existing service provision. Um, and I think for the adult group, the evidence that I've seen is that they're doing that. Um, so we, we were happy to tell them absolutely everything. Um, so this includes the support that he gets from family and friends. We were quite determined to make sure that they knew, knew what that support was. Um, so we, we had descriptions really of all his supporters. Um, so things that are support groups and things I would say to you really make sure that as you go into this process you've actually thought about all of the supports that are involved in disability support around people who are likely to be getting one of these sorts of plans. So the, the planning process for us, um, we, we met with two planners, I think later on they're going to start 
reducing that to one planner, but they had two planners with us through the whole process. I don't know whether that's because I'm known as a firm advocate. Um, that's possibly the case. Um, but I also think that they're actually making sure that, that their planners actually work together and know what they're doing. Um, the NDIS has got a, a big challenge in getting planners up to speed. I think it's a huge task. Um, I think the job of NDIS planning is actually too big for people, but um, um, with two of them we did all right. Okay? One of those planners had very relevant knowledge. Um, he had a brother with relatively severe autism. My impression is it wasn't quite as severe as my son's, but quite severe autism. And his family, and his brother is only a little bit younger than ours. So there was a lot of relevant understanding in the room, and that may not always be the case. But I hope it is. I hope that um, they're choosing their planners wisely. Um, and that their planners are doing a good job. And I have no reason to believe that's not happening at the moment. Um, so our NDIS planning process took three meetings. The first meeting, they sent us out a form and said, you know, write down everything that's happening, think about what your ideals and objectives are. And we went through that process a bit um, and took the form in, handed it to them. They had a bit of a scan of it. We had a lot, bit of a discussion. They met Kay. And, um, and then we progressed on. That meeting took about two hours, maybe two and a half hours. It was sort of scheduled for an hour and a half. Um, a week later we had a second meeting, but before the meeting they sent us out a draft plan. Um, less than 24 hours, but we had a chance to have a look at it. Went into the second meeting, it also went for a couple of hours, probably three hours, um, uh, went away again. It really went through and refined what they'd put down as goals and strategies and things, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, the third meeting, we arrived, they'd sent us out a draft plan for my son, and on that, um, I'd written, this really needs to be checked off against the needs assessment tool. So we walked into the meeting and they said, okay, the first thing we're going to do is complete the needs assessment tool. I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so we sat down and ran through the needs assessment tool and that took us, in our case, um, that took us uh, from nine o'clock in the morning till two o'clock. But I think, that's peculiar to somebody with really significant needs. Um, so it normally won't take that long. One of the complications though is that the needs assessment tool is not well designed for ASD. Okay. Um, the sort of examples are around physical disability and sensory disability. So there's, a, there's probably a bit of an art to filling that in and we'll talk a bit about that later on as well. Um, after that, um, we basically had an agreed plan and that had to be approved by higher management. Um, it was approved the next working day. So we had 11 working days from our first interview to the plan approval. Okay. Um, other people are experiencing longer times than that, but Given, given the sort of situation that we're dealing with, I thought that was actually pretty good going. We had a fourth meeting was where they handed over the plan and we talked a little bit about the implementation and the timing of how we go from what's going on now to the new situation. So that was a fourth meeting after the plan was approved. And we're now in that phase of trying to figure out how we do all of this in practice. So I'm really going to be talking about that initial getting through to the plan. That's really what my focus here is. So talking about um, Kay's plan, uh, it's really based very strongly on the goals. So we, we sort of talk about what sorts of goals in life um, are going to be achieved. And when I talk about goals, 
I'm, I'm saying fairly abstract things like um, things in his case like um, I would like to see him get into some tertiary education and, and get some learning out of that. Now that's actually a big challenge for the system um, and it's a fairly vague goal but I think while we're talking about goals, it's probably about vague goals that you want to talk and the end areas will be very comfortable about doing that. If you get more specific than that, they'll probably try and get you to be in their goals a bit more generic. Okay, so it's probably easier if you're ready for that, if you go in and say we want to talk about the, those less specific goals. And then we work through a process of coming up with objectives and the objectives that are significantly more specific than the goals. So we take the, the goals and come up with some specific items that relate to those goals. And then you talk about strategies for achieving those objectives and how you're going to measure that those objectives have been achieved. So they'll go through a process that's very much like that. And that's a pretty conventional process for doing this sort of thing. Um, I, I'm really comfortable with that as a model. I know uh, my wife has trouble doing the abstract goal stuff, but I, I'm really quite comfortable going abstract, concrete, sort of, and then measures and things. That's, that doesn't worry me at all. But uh, some people will struggle with that. And their planners will help you through that as well because that's what they're trying to achieve. Um, and for us that was really quite um, straightforward and friendly. Um, there was no really contention in any of that. Um, and, and I'll tell you the sorts of things that we said because I think they're what they're looking for. And I'll show, tell you why that's the best way to do it. Um, Kieran, uh, Kay's plan, <laughs> that's hard to, um, Kay's plan um, has to be reviewed in 12 months. The plan at the moment is to review it in 12 months. We can have it reviewed at any time. Um, so if we're not happy, we can turn around and review it or ask for bits of it to be reviewed at any time. And, th and that's the norm. That's what they expect us to have happen. Um, I will say that we lost a small service. We lost a cleaning service, but I think the cleaning service that we got uh, was really because disability services in the ACT said, well, we need to give you something and we can't think of anything else, <laughs> so we'll give you a cleaning service. So we've been having that for a few years and it sort of doesn't really suit us anyway. So, so losing that was not really a big issue to us because the things that we gained um, out of the, and included in the plan were much more significant. Um, so, so there'll be a bit of that sort of stuff will probably go on around some of the plans. Um, for us, there's a significant increase in funding, um, massively more than what we were getting under um, services from the ACT government. Um, so the lessons that I have really, um, uh, that Kay's plan and the funding that goes with it, um, is a major improvement on what we had before um, and I, am, I see no reason why most of them are not going to be like that. I think most plans will be better than the existing situation. Um, as I said, the NDIS planning process is designed to work from a sort of abstract or, or um, very general sorts of goals to more specific ways to achieve that. Um, and the other lesson I think from this is use the system, don't fight it. Um, basically, when you're doing these kind of negotiations, my advice to people is um, you ask for things and you'll get some things and you may not get some other things. Um, say yes to the things that, you, that they're offering, that they give you. If there's anything to fight about, win the first ones first and go back and, and have the further discussions and refinements later. Um, it's usually the best strategy. And if you've got something on the table and working, even if it's only a part of what you need, then the negotiations will usually go better. Okay? But my advice is, if you're not going to get everything, 
take what you're given to start with and then fight the smaller battles rather than make it into one big battle. Okay. Some suggestions. Um, one of the things that I would encourage people to do is ask politely whether your planner has uh, significant knowledge of the autism spectrum um, because there's no guarantee of that. And I, th I think it's reasonable for people who are on the autism spectrum to expect people who know about the autism spectrum um, to be doing the planning. So you can, there is a process where you can simply say, I would like another planner, please can I have a planner um, that has more knowledge of autism, okay? Um, and I would suggest to people that they ask that question up front. And, um, I mean, it's not a rude question, it's just, a basic fact. So um, that's just my first suggestion to people. Um, if they say no, then you know it's up to you how you react to that. Um, but it's I, I see no problem with asking. Um, I suggest that people accept the NDIS process pretty much as it is. Its chances of winning a, a different process are pretty small. So it's probably better to go with what's there and make it work for you rather than try and change it in any way. Um, and I, I always warn people, when you go into the negotiation, really try hard to make sure you hear what they have to say as well as having your own say. Um, one thing I would suggest to people is that they get the price list. Um, so under the providers section on the NDIS website, there's a list of how much providers can charge for certain services. That list has the item numbers that will appear on your plan. Okay, so if you're really keen and if you really want to get into the detail, before you go in, you can download the price list for the ACT and see what the descriptions of the items that will appear in your plan are going to be. So. And if you do that, that gives you the chance to actually use the same language as they're using. And that means that the communication about what sorts of services you want um, is going to be easier because there are going to be things that come up like the NDIS is not excited about paying for something called respite. Okay? Because respite is aimed at carers and the NDIS is aimed at people with disabilities who are participants. So if if respite is part of the service that you currently get and you want to get something that has the same function for both a person with a disability um, and the carer, then it's going to have to be talked about in terms of how it helps the person with a disability. That my biggest piece of advice, my biggest suggestion is help them give you funding. Right? So if you talk about things the way they want to think about it, um, if you use their language and their thinking, they're going to be much more comfortable giving you funding. If you're saying, I want this, and they're saying, well, we don't do that, we do this instead, then you're going to be fighting much more over it. So just let them use their language, and then when you come to implementing it, that's when you get influence the control. You've got the money then. <laughs> One thing I would suggest is have plenty of goals. So one of the things about my son's situation is that nobody's ever really talked about tertiary education for somebody with severe autism. Um, it's not part of the equation at all, right? Nobody thinks about that. And I go, we talk about equality in education and things. Why is there no, for what reason is there no tertiary education? Is it really just discrimination on sort of intellectual capacity or ability to pass tests or something? Is this really what tertiary education is all about? So for the first time we were actually able to go in and say, we actually have some tertiary education goals here. Um, and we will listen to and there's funding going in for that and a bit of a plan about how that might happen. Even if we have to change the world to achieve that, we have their support in doing that. Okay, so, so that was sort of interesting and really reassuring because that suggests to me that they really are walking the walk and talking the talk. I mean, that's, a, that's a really interesting issue to, to think about how that's going. Um, employment and financial, so everybody should really have goals in those areas. 
um, independent living goals, sort of see if you can pick out some abstract goals in all of these areas because they're likely to fund something in all of these areas. Okay? Because this is the language and this is what they're thinking about. Um, so social, leisure, community access. You can actually talk about goals in all of those areas with the expectation that, um, that they're going to be able to support something. But remember, keep your, your goals abstract. The concrete stuff comes later when you actually come to implementing it, which may even be after you've done the plan. Um, there's what I'm calling the secret needs assessment tool, it's SNAT. Um, we've, we've tried to FOI this document from them and they've said, no, we're not even going to give you this under FOI. Um, I had no idea what it was going to be and, and I can see why they want to keep it secret, it really doesn't suit ASD at all. Um, you know, you really uh, have to work on this. So it, you will go through this at some stage in the process. What was interesting to us is that it came up when it was no use to the process, right? Um, I think it's called the Special Needs Assessment Tool, but I call it the Secret Needs Assessment Tool because they're keeping it secret. One thing I warn you about is that when they give you draft documents and things, they sort of tend to have some funny dates on them. Like it said, this plan starts on the day that we had our first interview, and you sort of, and there's been complaints about this in the process. People have sort of thought, "Gee, the plan starts here," and you sort of go, "What this is really about is that the computer system has to put a date in, and the most obvious date is when it, when you first see them, right?" So I don't actually think these dates mean much, but they. For people on the spectrum, they can be quite alarming, okay? So just ask them about that if you're nervous. Just say, what's this date and can we change it? You know? <laughs> Should the date really be when the plan gets approved rather than the first time we met you and stuff? Um, and I've heard of quite a lot of people, and there have been complaints to the Senate committee on this issue. But for us, they said, no, no, this is just what gets whacked in there. Um, and it really isn't that meaningful, and it hasn't been meaningful in our case. So, so I'll forewarn people that that's part of how the process works at the moment. Um, one of the other questions that you're going to be asked is, do you want to self-manage your plan? Okay. Now, um, for me, that's the last thing in the world. Um, the pros are that there's more flexibility in who you choose as providers. Um, and the disadvantage is that you have to do all that accounting stuff that I really hate. So if you do go for managing the plan yourself, just have a good chat with them about what it really means. Okay, what, what that means that you're required to do and what the accounting processes are that are involved. Um, and partial self-management is an option. So you can choose to manage some of the funds that they provide and not manage others. Okay. Yeah. The July report told us um, how many people choose to self-manage. So they've always been selling this as like, you know, you can self-manage. But this is what the data says about what's going on. 2% of people are choosing to self-manage. Okay. Um, there are plan manage providers out there. There are people advertising that will manage your plan. The uptake at the moment is 0%. Okay. Which is a little bit odd, I'm not sure why that is, but um, that may go up eventually. But at the moment, there's not much. As you can see, there's a number of people are doing a combination of 
uh, agency managed and, and self-managed. The other thing that comes out of that report is that 26% of NDIS participants um, currently have autism and related disorder as their primary disability. Okay, This is the biggest single disability in the NDIS, okay? which came as a complete surprise to them. Okay. Um, so my conclusions, uh, try and start with the abstract goals, um, not, not how you're going to do things, but generally what, what it is that you want to achieve and then work down to specific stuff and probably have that conversation with them. For a lot of people that's hard, right? Getting abstract like that is hard. But, but that's probably what you want to do if you possibly can. And talk to people about it. Talk to your friends, talk to others about how to get your goals more abstract. Okay, that's my advice. Um, I think the NDIS system is probably okay for adults at this stage. It's as good as we can expect, which is really quite reassuring. Um, certainly the process we went through was pretty smooth. Um, so, and I just saw um, a couple of other people have said that they're in the process at the moment and they're finding the same thing. Um, so on, on the Facebook contacts are coming back and telling us a very similar sort of story. So I'm, I'm hoping that it wasn't just our experience, I'm hoping this is the normal experience. And the evidence is that way at the moment. Um, the NDIS is about participants, not about carers. Some people are going to be a bit disappointed by that. Oh, some people have been disappointed by that. I don't think it actually is as big a problem as some people think. Um, generally, um, if it's working well for people with disability, it's going to work pretty well for carers. So I don't really have a problem with that. Um, I, I'm expecting that most participants are going to get improved services, at least in the adult section. Right? Um, we're still going to have discussions about early intervention, but in the adult section, I think um, it's, it's looking pretty good at this stage. Um, so my advice is to people, I know lots of people are really quite nervous about this whole process. It's unknown, it's a new system, it isn't tested very well. I mean, it has, it has had a year's testing, but a lot of the testing has actually been in younger kids. Um, but I don't believe that there's a lot to fear. I think the way they're going about this in the adult section sector is, is working um, pretty well. It makes sense to me from what I can see. I mean, I would have liked the advocacy groups to be more involved and that we knew more about the internal details. But the external signs that I'm seeing at the moment for the adult section are OK. And my only concern is I'd like there to have been more autism awareness. Um, but I think that can be corrected and I think it can be corrected in a reasonable amount of time. Um, so my advice is just do it. JFDI. Just do it. Okay? I think that's all I've got.